And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Yvonne Noctegal, who had a near-death experience during brain surgery. Yvonne, thank you for joining us and welcome. It's good to be here. Yvonne, let's start on the day that you had the surgery and go from there. If I could back up just a little bit before the surgery. Sure. Um, uh, and explain that uh, I'd been having for about two years uh, mysterious symptoms and been in and out of the emergency room numerous times and was really dealing with a lot of wondering about my own, you know, trusting my own sense of reality. I, frankly, I wondered if I was a hypochondriac, that I was having these terrible symptoms, these headaches and inability to um, move my limbs right and whatnot. It was very much indica indicated by one particular doctor that it was sort of all in my head. So when I when it finally got so severe, and what I'm speaking about there is severe headaches, um, par partial paralysis of the left side of my body, um, visual disturbances, and that when I finally went in and a doctor took me seriously, it was almost a supernatural experience just being taken seriously. And um, he sent me in, I mean, the peace came over me, just someone was finally taking me seriously after two years of, you know, finally, I was debilitated, literally laying in bed, you know, hardly able to do anything at this point. Um, and then after they did a CT scan, the doctor came in the room, and this was a real a real powerful moment. He came in having seen what was a nearly four centimeter tumor in my brain, near my brain stem. Um, and he stood at the door to the examining room there in the ER. And he had a look on his face and I could just see that he needed to tell me that I was going to die. I mean, he believed that I could see it. It was written all over his face. And in that moment, there was just beyond when in the doctor's office, there was a peace that came over me that lifted me up and gave me a strength that was beyond anything I possess. Um, and my heart just broke for him. And I... And I looked at him and I, and I said, well, what, what did you see? And I literally helped him tell me about this tumor. Um, and, he's, and he was shaken up and, and he said, it's large. And, and I said, well, what do we need to do? And he said, well, it, it, it needs to come out of there. And, well, long story short, he ended up, they ended up sending me by ambulance to a neuro hospital, a better hospital, because they weren't equipped to deal with it there. And um, that particular piece, that confidence, and I'd even call it joy that I had, stayed with me. I mean, I was... <sighs> People told me later, oh, they had you on some great drugs in there, and I wasn't on drugs. <laughs> I was just filled with this, this incredible peace. And I knew whether I lived or I died, I knew it was all right. I, you know, I felt completely at peace with God. You know, I, I am a Christian, and I... So, you know, my faith in God was very much, I, I understood that my eternity was secure in Christ. and But that became so vividly real to me that it really didn't matter if I left this world or stayed. It was just a matter of whatever God wanted for me. Um, so then um, they, uh, the morning they, they wheeled me into surgery, and I'm still just you know, joyful patient, <laughs> what I looked like to everyone, but 
I mean, you, I could show you pictures of me in the hospital and I'm just so happy because part of it was just the release of that people finally believed me. I mean, it was two years of um, being told, you know, we don't know what's wrong with you, lady, <laughs> you know. So finally, people were listening to me. So that was huge. But it was it was bigger than that. It was really some kind of a supernatural joy. And then um, in the operating room, of course, they put me under the anesthesia and um, slipped into darkness. And then all of, I, I was suddenly wide awake. And I'm looking around, and I, and I wasn't in the hospital. It was a quiet, peaceful place. Um, I didn't know where I was, though. I was trying to figure, where where am I? And and around me were these beautiful colors, this uh, warm colors, like auburn and gold and uh, light and and I was trying to take in. It took me a it took me a bit to sort out where am I? What is this? What am I looking at? And um, came to realize that I was sitting on this enormous wing. And when I say enormous, I want to say 50, 60 feet or something. But you know, it was a different realm, so it's you know. Uh, physicality is hard to really uh, explain there. And um, so there was this beauty. I, this was holding me. And I, I one of my first things that, that, that occurred to me was, this is what's been holding me all along. I just couldn't see it that this peace, this something giving me this strength carrying me through that I've been experiencing for the past few days, this was it. And it was, ultimately it was, or at least this was the way that it was presented to me, was an angel's wing holding me. And now I... You know, physicality and that realm is a, um, it's, it's something I struggle with sometimes when I hear people talk about NDEs as though, you know, that this physicality is tangibly, ugh, it's hard to explain, um, is actually what it is where I, I see it more as that these are visions. And we see what we're supposed to see. It's not like physicalities in this world. And I'm not sure if that makes sense. Um, but uh, anyway, just going on as the experience. So I realized I was being held. I realized I hadn't made it. And um, I felt like I was being transported to whatever was next. Um, I thought back to my family. I knew they'd be sad. Um, but it was all right. I knew God had them. It was not to be fretted over. There was no sorrow. There was joy. There was peace. There was a love surrounding me that... I can only express like um, like the love that a mother feels for her baby when she's holding her baby. Just that almost that perfect, um, unquestionable love. Just nothing can stop it. And I was surrounded with that. I was held in that. And, and just that was the greatest comfort of all. I mean, everything that I'd strived for in this world and all of this, you know, am I okay with this person and that person and self-doubt and um, it was, uh, you know, no, you're loved. 
you are loved. And that was the most powerful feeling. And, um, you know, end of years talk about the, um, you know, what is it called? The life review. And I guess you could call it that, that maybe, you know, maybe attribute this to that as I thought of everything I'd ever strive for in this world and, um, and everything that I'd done wrong, frankly, the things, my, my regrets, my, um, yeah, man, like just the regrets, the things where I'd failed, um, sin, if you will, had never happened. Um, and that was, that was the most immense of all of it was that I was literally experiencing my salvation, that all of that, it didn't, it didn't come here. It didn't belong here. So, um, I don't know. I started to kind of get a better bearing of my surroundings and reach down to try to touch this being that was holding me. And, um, my vision was perfect. Uh, you know, so I, I looked down and he looked like he was made of, you know, I think of how they describe visions in the Bible is what it reminded me of that he was like a, a liquid gold, but transparent. And he was light. He, he was, he was a light being. You, you hear that a lot of times, light being, but he was a light emanating being. And, um, and I could see him, see all the way down to his, like what would be his vein structure, except he was all one piece. He wasn't particles like everything in this world is made of, you know, tiny particles. Um, trying to remember the next moment, I, I felt something in my leg. And um, my leg, right? Because I, when I reached down to, to try to touch him, I didn't see my hand. So I realized, oh, I'm not in my body. And then, and when I felt something in my leg, I realized they must still be working on me. And so I was aware that I was somehow in both worlds, even though what I saw, what I was experiencing was this world, but there was that other world working on me. What, now, one thing that just kind of a aside um, I had always thought for some reason that I would be laying on the table on my stomach as they work on the back of my head. They opened me from my crown to the bottom of my neck. Um, but in fact, I learned watching Grey's Anatomy <laughs> months later that when they do brain surgery, that the patient is sitting up. And here during this NDE, I was sitting up in a sitting up position with my legs in front of me. So it was something that little things like that came together afterwards. And I realized, wow. Um, so I had that feeling in my leg, realized I was in two worlds there somehow. And, and something caught my eye off to, off to the left. And I saw all these people, but they didn't look like they look in this world. They were, it was more like I was looking at them from that world and they were all made of particles, tiny little particles. And I could see that they were almost like silhouettes, but three dimensional. Um, they were talking to one another and just about their business. And they were concerned about something and, I was just trying to make them out. And that's when I heard a voice and the voice, it was a, this beautiful, I can still hear it. Just this, this beautiful voice of just love and power. And, and he said, it was a male voice. The multitude is petitioning for you. 
And I was just overwhelmed with, because this was, it was like a sea of people. These people are praying for me. And it really, it touched my heart. Um, and as I just watched them a little longer, a, a few seconds later, however long, I don't know, don't ask me about time in that place. It's completely different. There's not vocabulary for a lot of these things. I've struggled to try to even express them. Um, and then he said, and this time it was like an announcement, a proclamation or something. He said, the petition is granted. It was just very strong. The petition is granted. And, and that was the end of the vision. I mean, in that instant, I heard hospital sounds around me again. And um, and here I I was so disappointed, <laughs> you know, because I I was ready to meet the Lord. I was ready to meet Jesus. I was excited about where I was going. It wasn't a matter of um, oh my word, I'm dying. <laughs> you know, I didn't want to come back, but. That wasn't my choice. It had been decided that I was coming back for whatever his purpose was for me. And um, there was there were there was conversation around me. I heard the nurses, probably three or four of them around me. Um, and one was holding my hand and um I heard one over here say she keeps saying she's in heaven. And the one holding my hand, she says to me, and I've re repeated her words many times, um, sweetie, sweetie, you're at Skyline Medical Center in Nashville, Tennessee. We're not letting you go to heaven today. And I just realized, well, I'm back. This, you know, this is this is where I am. Kept squeezing my eyes shut. No, 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 I don't want to be here. <laughs> I, want to, I want to go back. But no, God had his reasons for bringing me back here. And that's been apparent. That was January 2011. Um, and um, it was the beginning of a whole different chapter in my life. You know, these, these experiences, end of years always say they're changed by their experience, very much true for me. I can literally see my life as before and after that experience. Is it? Yeah. Yvonne, thank you for sharing your experience with us. Do you think that voice was coming from the angel or some other being? Um, oh, I'm, I'm quite sure that it was coming from the angel. And, um, that being was um, a kind of a fascinating part of the entire experience. It was because I, I believe I've I've put much of this together over the years since then. At the time, it was just experience, and I wasn't quite sure what all had happened. It was just overwhelming, of course, right? This holiness. It was. All I wanted was to be in that place with this pure truth and pure holiness and pure love. Um, no, I believe it was him, and he was wasn't is um, this perfectly obedient being whose very life and purpose and everything is only to do what he's given to do by God. Um, and I say that because for, you know, obviously it was a long recovery, um, probably a year and a half before I was fully myself again. Um, and I would talk to him, you know, I'd sit in bed. I knew he was there. I felt his presence. I knew he was there. Um, and he didn't talk back, but I knew he wouldn't. 
because he only speaks what God gives him to speak. You know, it's not like humans. We have a different, and, and you know, the Bible says that the angels are amazed or they wonder at, at mankind, at, you know, the, the life, the type of life, the freedoms that we've been given that for God's purposes in this, in this creation. Um, so that, that was just a whole thing, just my relationship with my guardian angel where, you know, I speak to him and I know he hears me, but he'll only speak what the father gives him to speak. Uh, but he was very much a comfort, just his presence being there with me through the weeks of, um, frankly, torrential pain that, you know, that, that was the healing process after that. It was a massive tumor. It was a big thing to recover from. I noticed that sometimes you refer to your experience as a vision. Mm-hmm. So was the experience real? And what I mean by that is, were you conscious in another realm? Or when you say a vision, are you saying it's more like it was a dream? Not a dream. Absolutely real. But um, I think it, NDEs, I think people look to them and are fascinated with them because we want to see beyond the veil and you know that that is the reason for the fascination with entheogens like ayahuasca um and um man wants to see beyond the veil um and so ndes are looked at looked to for answers of what is beyond that veil but um, there, the spiritual realm is still the realm that we visit or our eyes are opened to is still part of this creation. It's not heaven. In other words, these are not resurrections. And that's why I call it a vision rather than I don't really even like the term near-death experience because I think people have very similar experiences on ayahuasca and um, through some transcendental meditation. Um, and it, it really is just the, I guess, what, what the scripture would call the second heaven, which is, you know, inside the confines of this creation, there is physicality, there is the sky, heaven. And then there is this spiritual dimension, even though I don't like the word dimension because it's scientific and I've, well, the whole question of scientism and all of that starts coming into play. But that um, to actually die and come back, a resurrection would involve being in heaven outside of this creation in the presence of a holy God. And you know, we couldn't, yeah, to come back from that would be a resurrection. And so I, I think that the, you know, the people that see loved ones, and, and I don't question that anyone actually sees what they claim they see during an NDE, but um, they'll see things that, like seeing loved ones and seeing, I don't know, diff different things that give them hope in this world. I think that they're, those they're given to them to see. Um, are they real? Yeah, they're real. You know, but our understanding of real is kind of an empirical understanding. And the spiritual realm is different than that. You know, it, it's real in in actually a more real way um, than what we understand as tangible reality. Since you noticed that you didn't have a leg on the other side, do you feel like you were just an orb of energy? Orb of energy. Um, I felt like I was a spirit being. 
not energy necessarily. Um, no, not energy. No, I was a spirit. And I, I believe that we are, essentially, we are spirit. We're not bodies with a spirit. It's the opposite. We most essentially are spirits with a body. And, you know, the other reason people are fascinated with NDEs is I think, or or the supernatural in, in, in general has such a draw because we we live in a society where naturalistic science is so embedded in our perception. You know, it used to be before, I guess, the early 1900s, before, you know, naturalistic science really took hold scientific philosophy empiricism that um you know belief in the supernatural was a given right and throughout the ages there was always a supernatural in our society today it's you're almost looked at as not intelligent if you question you know the confines of evolution and empiricism and there is no outside being that caused all this which i don't know i just always go back to okay so it all just started with a bang but what went bang yeah <laughs> yeah it doesn't make sense um but i think it in reaction to that it, paralleling also you know liturgy in Christianity, Christianity has been also turned into religion and liturgy. And I think both those things, empiricism and liturgy, have us so in this realm that, it, that our spirits, who we truly are, are hungry, are desperate for, you know, we know there's a higher truth. And... Um, you know, it just creates this longing for it, you know, to be trapped in this empirical uh, world that scientists and our schools of education have kind of locked us into. Um, I think that's where the fascination comes from is innately we know we are not bodies with spirit. We are innately spirit. And it's like this has been hidden from us. It's we've been prohibited from, you know, it's not um, allowable truth, you know, to believe that the spiritual realm exists. So no, not an orb, a spirit. <laughs> Do you think you were in some type of intermediate? or intermediary place between here and heaven? Or do you think you were at the gates of heaven or actually in heaven? As I was trying to ex express earlier, this is in my book, I, I spent, as I was putting my book together, I actually spent a lot of time trying to sort that out. Where was I? You know, the Bible speaks of three heavens. Um, and Paul having saying that he actually visited the third heaven, which would, that is a rarity. I don't think NDEers are doing that again. These aren't resurrections, but Paul, that, uh, his experience in Lystra, the apostle Paul, where he was stoned, he, that's probably the closest thing the Bible really has to a death and resurrection or where someone comes back and talks about it Lazarus did but he didn't talk about it um he talked about the third heaven so like I say um I I think NDEs occur in the spiritual realm within the confines of the creation um which was veiled from us at the fall um Adam and Eve, you know, they before their fall, they were they saw the spiritual realm. They communicated with the serpent. They they had a much different reality. I think they were much far superior to us in intellect and 
in every way. Um, but that realm, um, being in that realm was, that's where they were deceived. And that, that's when the veil was put up and, you know, there was an angel positioned at the Garden of Eden, scripture tells us, and there was a blazing sword waving to and fro so they could not re-enter and get to the tree of life and remain in this fallen state forever. Um, so, yeah, the, I lost my train of thought. The question being, which realm is it? Oh, yeah. So, yeah, and since then we have been in this, we see the, the natural, the physicality of the creation, but we're, you know, we trust God through faith and the it's the Bible's position that, you know, the enemy lures us into that realm for the purpose of deceiving us. Um, which is another tangent maybe I could take right there is the fact that I was on an angel's wing. Now, I believe that the spiritual realm within the confines of this creation, um, it is neither a holy realm nor evil. I think it's that both exist there, that good and evil exist there. And I believe that evil is, can be very deceptive and that it masquerades as light. And that's how Adam and Eve were deceived. The serpent came as a being of light. Um, and so I think, you know, when we, you know, like the shamans from days of old have always brought people into that realm. Um, and they see beings of light there, but I believe they, those beings can be very deceptive. And um, and I feel like, um, you know, as a Christ, as a believer, that as a Christian, one who's born in the spirit, in Christ, that the wing also was shown to me it was the vision was given to me in that way showing me that I was protected because I saw everything that I saw in that vision you know I compared everything up against the word of God had I seen anything which taught me something new no had I seen anything which contradicted what I already knew no it was like I was I was protected from the deception that does exist in that realm um so yeah it's not good or bad but um that there is both that both exist there and we shouldn't strive to get there either is the other thing i'm personally strongly believe how have you changed since your experience that's a big one um Wow. Probably the, the way I could describe myself more, uh, I mean, best, I have had from that time just an insatiable curiosity about everything. I mean, it is like I have a brand new childlike curiosity. I wanted to understand everything. Um, I saw I had a new discernment about the, the powers behind what operates in this world. It was, like, it was a new perspective. It was like this greater spiritual perspective of what's actually happening in the world. Um, I'm unable to really, like, I can't even watch a, a news report comes to mind. Um, I cannot walk through life completely just unaware of the spiritual realm anymore. I'm aware it's here. And I have a, a love for people. 
that I, I mean, I always loved people. I've always been someone who loves people, but to love people enough to, you know, say the uncomfortable things, to, you know, love them for the sake of the truth, you know, that, that there is a God and that Jesus Christ was the son of God and that he has made a way for them to live eternally beyond this realm. That's, you know, that's paramount to me and where I've always believed that now I really in every in in every way I, I I try to make sure that I understand this correctly and I like through my website christianobserver.net um I try to dispel a lot of the falsehoods and different ideas that people have that are more that are so prevalent in our day that would take away from that hope by trying to add to it it takes away from it i don't know if that makes sense um that i think that's that's it i have no fear of death at all i mean i'm perfectly ready if i'm supposed to go right now after this interview praise god i'm you know i'm glad to go I live very much with a sense of purpose, you know, that whatever I'm supposed to do, it isn't about me or what I want to do in life or materialism or it's about, you know, what, what does God have for me to do? Because I, I very much, I was given a second, an extra season of life, really. I shouldn't. I shouldn't be functioning as well as I am. I mean, you can only see me from here down, but here up, I mean, but um, I'm deficit free. And with the type of tumor I had, I shouldn't be. You know, I read story after story of people that had the type of tumor I had, and they're notorious for growing back. Mine, I had a little piece of it left. They had to leave behind because that's when they had problems with my vital signs. And three MRIs in, I have regular MRIs to check for regrowth. Um, that piece vanished. It's gone. So I, I, I very clearly feel like I'm my life here is not about me. It's about what am I supposed to be doing? here for the sake of others and i i try to live by that every day i'm not saying i'm a perfect person or a holy person or a great teacher or anything like that i'm just a humble just a humble woman really trying to listen to god and love people the way i'm supposed to each day and be responsible with those things that he's shown me and given me to share so my focus, I guess, has shifted in that regard. Um, is the things I can think of, how I've changed. Has the memory of this experience faded over time? In some ways, in some ways a little bit. In other ways, I remember it better. It's a funny thing. It's it's like a living, moving growing thing because there are things that I you know like like the realization that I was protected on the wing that didn't come until recently um some of the details of it though I'll go back and I'll you know because I was always scribbling writing during those first few days even when my brain was pretty jumbled from the surgery the brain trauma um remembering what you know helping myself remember but um no it'll never leave me it'll it, you know it's some details will fade but then you know I'll, I'll stop and just think and you know I'm brought by back and usually I, I understand them a little bit more as time goes on 
Was there a sense that there was no time on that side? Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. That um, this um, everything, thousands of years or whatever, that this earth is, it's just a blip. It's nothing. Um, that realization was among the things, you know, obviously I didn't go into everything in the experience. There was there was a lot to it. That was just what I called to mind trying to relive it here but yeah one of the things was thinking back on this world and realizing how brief it really is in in comparison with eternity which is timeless there's no i mean i say this happened and then that happened and yet yeah there was a timelessness to it have you thought, why me? Why not anybody else? Constantly. Oh, yeah. That's a, it's humbling. You know, it's, it's really humbling. Why me? Um, It's not for me to answer. I I just try. I just go before God each day and you know, I, I greet the morning with thank you. Thank you. I'm here another day. Thank you. I'm here. Show me. What do you have me here, here for today? You know, and I um I'm, I'm, I'm another way I've changed is I'm bold. You know, I, I, when I know something, I know something and I'm, and I'm bold with it. And so the things I put on my website, you know, people get offended, you know, and things I put in my videos, people, I, I have, I get some of the meanest emails, <laughs> You know, people write to me, you know, that's wrong. You know, this is blah, blah, blah. And they'll come in with their, you know, they learned this in Bible class or whatever. And, um, yeah, and I can't say that's pleasant. <laughs> but um, I also, I just, I don't know, I, I can't deny what what I'm called to do and I now I I do take everything to heart I mean if someone criticizes me I will stop and I'll check my facts and I'll you know I I listen but um you know I really I really follow you know the God's word what good scriptural exegesis trying to understand it as best I can and and the you know, combined with the leading of his Holy Spirit, which, you know, when I hear truth, I, I know it's true. And then I read in, in God's word and yeah, and there it's affirmed. Yeah, it's, that is the truth. And, you know, and I, I hold on to that. Um, why me? I have no idea. Jeff, I have no idea. I'm just honored. You know, it was a high price of admission. People say to me, you know, oh, I envy people like you. I wish I could have an experience like that. And I say, no, you don't. <laughs> no, it was it was a rough road. And a lot of end eaters will say the same thing, you know, getting that close to, you know, death often involves a long struggle back and whatnot. You mentioned that you have a website. And if people want to reach out to you, is that the best way they can do that? Yes. There's a contact page on there, which has an email address. You have to copy paste it. I found that if I put a link there, that it got me all kinds of spam. But yeah, if you go to christianobserver.net and go to the contact page, there's an email there that you can reach me through. It sounds like you may have a new ability or abilities after your NDE. If so, what are they? Hmm. 
abilities. For example, you mentioned that you have this knowingness. Mm -hmm. Which is a, a common thing with indie ears. So if you go to IONS, the list of common after effects, I think no, a sense of knowing is one of them. Mm, okay. I've got, I've got that all spelled out in my book. I, the whole, I think I have IONS' entire list of common you know, effects that indie ears have in common, the way they've changed. Are there any other abilities on that list that you have now that you didn't have prior? My faith is stronger. Um, there is there is a knowing, and not always, but I'll just I'll see things, and I'm more inclined to immediately pay attention when I when I have a sense about something. Um, supernatural abilities, I wouldn't go that far. I, it, it is more just a, an awareness, um, an awareness and an increased faith, a confidence in that I know, you know, I know that my, my faith in, in Christ is secure and, um, yeah. What inspires you about your experience? Just that it's all real. You know, having been born and raised in this empirical world where from our earliest school days, God is just omitted from the picture, right? Everything is empiric empirical naturalism. Um, and you know the television is it if when i watch television with my husband at night it never ceases to be at the forefront of my awareness there's no god on television it's just not there you know it this world just gives you empiricism or it'll give you mysticism you know that there is some hope in the spiritual realm which is really still in the confines of the creation um, but God, a higher hope, higher than religion, higher than man, you know, trying to ascend on his own, which we, we don't have that within us. People would argue with me, but the scripture would say, and I would agree with that, that we don't have that within us, the ability to ascend, to transcend this realm, maybe into the spirit realm, sure but not to eternal life. No, we don't, we don't, we don't possess that. Um, yeah, just the inspiration is just how real the supernatural is. Um, yeah, increasing my faith and that there is a purpose. That there's a great purpose. Um, it really brought the scripture and my faith in Christ to life. And that inspires me each and every day. Is your YouTube channel the same name as your website? It is. My YouTube channel is Christian Observer. And I also have a Rumble channel by the same name. And I actually upload more videos to the Rumble channel than I do to YouTube. Now, your book is called Glimpse of Glory. Yes. What is it about and where can people find it? Glimpse of Glory... The subtitle is A Critical Examination of Near-Death Experiences by an NDE Ear. And it is exactly that. It uh, I broke it into three parts. The first part is just the testimony of, you know, the, the situations that led up to the near-death experience and then, you know, re- integrating back into the world afterward and what all that entailed. Um, then part two is really asking the hard questions of NDEs, such as, um, you know, why do people have NDEs and they come back with these truths? And we all, all of us NDEers, we feel like what we saw is absolutely the truth. And um, 
so then why do these truths so often contradict each other? How can they all be true if they're, you know, mutually contradictory? Those kind of questions bothered me. Um, and so I wanted to get down, you know, to the to the um, bottom of what what are these experiences? Where are they taking place? Um, pretty much a lot of the things we've already been discussing uh, and uh, found that there's a predominant theme in most NDEs, and that is pantheistic monism or oneism. And so my book takes, you know, it goes back in the history of pantheistic monism, oneism. Where does it begin? Uh, how far back in history can we follow this teaching? And um, and then I, the third section of the book is, um, a lot of Christians have a problem with the third section of the book because I'm pretty tough on the church in the third section, showing how um, what how the gospel of Jesus Christ, you know, who came to bring freedom to a world enslaved in this natural reality and trying to escape it through religious practice, through um, some kind of ascension of their own efforts through works or what have you. Jesus came to set us free from all of that, and that that has been turned into another great control system for you know different control systems for lack of a better word um liturgy religion law um subtle and in, i mean in in so many ways what the world sees as christianity is not christianity it's it's religion it's people going through motions through law through many of the, the same things that the religious systems before Christ had men going through. So I kind of show how that, you know, that has kind of come in and robbed the simplicity of the gospel from, um, from people and given a false idea of what Christianity is to the world. Um, yeah, that, and I go through that systematically. I start, you know, with the history of Christ and come come through history with it. And so then what is truth? And, you know, ultimately try to answer that big question. What is the truth and how can we know what it is? What, you know, if we can't hang our hat, our, our anchor onto experience, you know, if we can't say, oh, well, this near-death experience or whatever has given us truth if we can't do that because those truths are contradicting each other then what do we hold on to where do we anchor onto truth and um so i, I tackle that um i try to really do it in a way where no matter what walk of life you're coming from you know, because I, I tried to like take di different people's viewpoints, keep them in mind as I was, you know, writing what I, what I, my research had found. And I've got, there's 12 pages of sources cited at the end of it. The entire work took me almost five years. I went back to school um, at, how old was I when I went back to school? I guess 59 to finish it because I really felt my lack of education as I started to really dig into this and got my degree just last year in That's communications great. journalism. So yeah, I think it I think I've produced something I'm proud of it and you know I, people many people have written to me just saying that it's really been um an invaluable help to them and they were appreciative for it yvonne before we finish up can you leave us with one last positive message 
there most definitely is life beyond this world. There is no question of that. It it isn't it isn't a matter of you know finding out that there is life beyond this world. There is. The question is um, finding the truth, and that's a different that's a different thing than finding a spiritual realm. And the truth made itself known to us in the person of Jesus Christ. He came, he lived among us. I mean, our entire calendar was shifted because of him. He did exist. He fulfilled the law that we could never fulfill. He did it all. And all we need to have the truth and live eternally is to believe in him to turn from trying to do it on our own through all this religious practice and everything we try to do um, and just believe in him. And he will give us not only eternal life, but an experiential life, a new birth in our spirit and dwell with us, the like scripture says. Um, he is life. He is the truth. He is the entire purpose of my existence. And I, I hope for everyone to know, to know him. And that's my message. Yvonne, thank you for your message and thank you for being my guest. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.